Tom hasn't really need uh, an introduction. Uh, he's, uh, as you may be aware, the creator of F-Sharp, uh, knowledgeable uh, about uh, all aspects of the language and the ecosystem. Um, and he's here tonight uh, to talk about the work he's been doing with uh, the Xamarin team and uh, making mobile applications uh, with F-Sharp all the way down. Um, uh, so I'll hand over to uh, Don in a minute. Um, just to say, we don't currently have um, any dates for future F Sharp talks. Uh, we do have a couple in the pipeline, including hopefully uh, one from me. Uh, just need to prepare it. I think I've said that at the last three talks now. Um, uh, so uh, if you do have an interest in a particular area and you'd like to hear a talk uh, about it, please let me know. Or if you'd like to do a talk, um, please give me a shout. I'm very happy to. Uh, range venues and dates and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. Um, over to Tom, thanks very much. Okay. Uh, I normally move around quite a bit in my talks, I'm not used to having one of these. I might try to do it like this. Let's see. Oh, I guess I'll. Right. Um, <laughs> great to speak here. Um, no. Thanks, Melendez. Uh, great to have this second venue. I mean, home is definitely skills matter. That's where our heart will always be for the F Sharp London meetup, and we'll often be meeting back there. But um, it, it's really great to be able to take the chance to go to different venues around London and allow you know, different uh, people here at Canary Wharf, obviously, a bit easier to get to. And if any of you have other venues you'd like to be able to offer, uh, for, we would also, you know, uh, like to like to use those. I live over on the west side of town, uh, <laughs> over Richmond Way, so it's a fair hike over here. So if anybody knows any good West End theatres that I can use or something, we could we could make use of. Uh, that'd be great. Um, okay, uh, Jim, uh, where's Jim? He's here. Jim Bob Bennett is going to be um, helping me with part of the talk. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a framework called Elmish uh, Xamarin Forms. It's currently called Elmish Xamarin, Xamarin Forms. We'll probably change the name in some way to make it a little bit shorter. Uh, I'm going to be calling it EXF for most of the uh, evening. That's the URL. Uh, I, uh, you're welcome to look up the documentation uh, and, and, and sort of ping me with questions uh, or prepare questions based on what's there. Um, and it's, things are in pretty good state with EXF. I've been working on it for the first half of this year with other people who I shall now thank. Uh, I'll put those people up here, I'll go through them in a moment. Uh, and I'm really very happy with where the framework has got to. Uh, it, it's not a big thing, it's quite a, you know, you can walk through all the code, it's in the one repository. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's in good shape from an engineering perspective and the core design elements I'm pretty, pretty confident. We've, we've, we've got them right for what we want to achieve. And uh, uh, now this is, this is, one thing I really like about this is we've set it up as an F-sharp community project. I'm one of the maintainers on the, on the project. And we have co-maintainers, a co-maintainer called uh, uh, Timothy. Uh, and um, and we're welcoming, we welcome uh, one or two more co-maintainers as well. People who can actually prepare releases, uh, assess bug fixes and the like. And, um, Timothy really deeply understands the core design principles that we've used, uh, which I'll, many of which I'll be going through here as well, and uh, has been making some great extensions uh, and, and done a release on it recently as well. Uh, the project is under FS Projects, which is the F-Sharp community incubation space. Uh, there's a whole host of different projects under there. It's a very, so if you've got projects in your which are, in a sense, um, potentially you know, broader than just things you use and you want to share them more generally. Sometimes it's very, very sensible to bring them in under a sort of neutral community organization where uh, it, it, it's no longer quite so associated with your GitHub URL, but you might find that co-maintainers come on board and uh, you can sort of broaden out the support base for the, for the library or the technology or the um, samples or the the coding dojos, whatever you have, uh, whatever assets you have and you want to bring them into the community space. Uh, I, I and Sergi Tion, who does the F-Sharp Weekly, are the kind of uh, maintainers of the overall um, GitHub uh, FS projects. And um, it's, the only real thing is that we like there to be two, uh, a backup maintainer for all, either Sergi or me or the FS projects account becomes sort of a backup maintainer where if you disappear, 
and somebody else w really wants to take over maintenance of some open source, uh, so source tech or, or, or education material or whatever it is, then we can you know, do the right thing and make sure there's a transition. It allows us to get some continuity in these F-sharp uh, incubation kind of things. Many great things have come out of FS projects, including Packet is on the FS projects, uh, and the virtual F-sharp power tools were originally done under the F-sharp community incubation space, and, um, and, and many other things are under there as well. So please do take advantage of that and become as a sort of, as a community space. Um, okay, people to thank. Timothy, uh, Jim, who's been doing some great talks on EXF. Uh, it was inspired originally by what we call a half Elmish version of mo a mobile programming for Xamarin uh, called Elmish.forms by someone called Boris D. The mysterious last name, I'm not sure who that is. Uh, and um, Jason, Eugene, creator of Elmish, and, and the other people mentioned there. Thanks to all of those. Okay. Uh, this is a new talk. I haven't done this talk before. I will be trying to do demos, uh, uh, live demos that could fail and there might be a restart time, uh, if, if, uh, but we'll, we'll see how they go. Uh, I'm not a UI designer and I am a compiler framework guy, so I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to teach you good design uh, in this. It's really, that is really up to you. I will teach you the basics of, of EXF. And uh, you know the good, the, but it, it, uh, it is a framework which I've found uh, liberates me to think more about the design elements and less about the coding elements, which is a big theme in what we're trying to achieve with F# -sharp all the way through, a language which lets you lie in the domain uh, rather than you know worrying too much about the details of the coding. Okay, that's why we use a lot of inference in F# -sharp, uh, is of course to confer many many details that we that we don't want to have to make explicit all the time. Um, just to say, EXF is not a sort of a, a wrapper for all of Xamarin. It's really about the core design of, of an app, uh, and you use it in conjunction with a whole range of other libraries. Uh, Xamarin Essentials is, is an essential one. Uh, if, you're, if you're making use of the things on the phone, like location, um, contacts, and the like, then you'll be wanting to use Xamarin Essentials. You can go through all the features that are in that, that library. Uh, and some resources for how to get involved. There's a, a, a FSSF a Slack channel called Mobile Dev, uh, where we chat about this stuff a bit, and of course Twitter and the, the project forums. And Jim will have more resources, resources I think. If you, have you got a resource slide? Now then there's a, Jim has curated a set of resources called Awesome F Sharp, Awesome Xamarin, Elmish Xamarin Forms, and that's a great set of resources to follow. Okay, uh, here's, Here's what I'll be running through. Uh, okay, just when all the demos fail, here's some screen grabs of the sort of things we're trying to build. Uh, the yeah, I'll be kind of going going through these bits. Hopefully, you'll see them most of the live. Um, okay, so early F sharp. I've been writing a history of F sharp recently. Andrea, thank you very much for all the feedback you've been giving. Uh, so I'll, I'll open up the community on second draft probably for the Hopple. History of Programming Languages Conference, which runs every 10 years. And there's one in 2020, and uh, they asked for an F-sharp uh, submission. Doesn't mean it'll get in, but uh, it means I've actually taken the time to write up a few, about a 30-page history of early F-sharp, really up until 2011 or so. Uh, and one of the things we, um, you know, F-sharp is all about functional programming, bringing functional programming to .NET, Again, the benefits of uh, originally sort of the core of Camel design and bringing that and combining it with .NET and .NET gets the benefits of OCaml and OCaml gets the benefit of .NET. Uh, that's the core idea. And it's, and it's developed since then with having a lot of great new functional programming features and actually bringing a lot to the .NET uh, platform as well. But um, it, what it meant is that we didn't ever have a really strong opinion about uh, architecture or a whole sort of app development. Okay, we, 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 we kind of said, well, .NET has its ways of doing app development. f a great language. Uh, functional programming is, is great, definitely in the small, and has some contributions to sort of architectural sort of design principles. But, but we're going to use f to do WinForms apps, WinForms apps, for example, way, way back. Uh, and and, and f get, often gets used like that. It's a fantastic functional programming language in the context of existing design patterns. Um, but we can, you know, we can do better than 
that. You know, which, uh, there, in a lot of ways, things are maturing in the whole functional programming space, uh, and particularly through in the, on the front end, particularly through the system called Elm, which I'll be talking about in a bit. Oh well, is really the inspiration for the, the whole the whole the whole space that we're in, and. Um, Okay, um, so we kind of lack, lack the opinion. Now, some, some parts of the community had stronger opinions about what app development would look like with F-Sharp. Uh, we'd have web, <coughs> have web Sharper for a long time. Uh, there's, off, there's a few good frameworks for doing MVVM uh, kind of design patterns uh, in a fairly nice way with F-Sharp. Uh, but um, it's the first time in this that I've certainly kind of gone through and, and form, formulated a stronger opinion on, on functional app development. Uh, okay, I've, I've decided to do two years uh, with the Xamarin and now more generally the developer division teams are taking a break from Microsoft Research. Uh, it's a, a secondment in the language of British English, although Americans definitely don't understand what that term means, so they call it a rotational or something like this. I think the idea that you, you have the option of going back somewhere is like on a two-year employment time frame, which in the context of an American job where you can get fired at, you know, more or less overnight, uh, it doesn't mean anything in America. Like what that two-year promise by an American corporation is like, yeah, okay. Uh, so anyway, we're do I'm doing two years um, rotational or secondment with the, Ameri uh, with the Xamarin and DevDiv teams. Uh, about half my time is spent on core F sharp issues, and that is absolutely great. It's been allowing me to get a lot of core things done with the language engineering and the compiler and the compiler services and a whole I mean, with visual F sharp tools. We've got F sharp 4.5 out the door and so on. But I try to reserve about 50% of my time for sort of apply, helping apply F sharp in different settings. And that's it at the moment. For the first half of the year has been in Xamarin. And I'll also um, be looking uh, certainly at F sharp and data science areas and a whole a bunch of other things uh, over the next while. So in making the decision to work at Xamarin um, I, and look at F sharp there, I was certainly conscious of the fact that you know we live, as I say here, on an Android iOS planet. It's been heading in that direction for a long time. It's, it's web and Windows as well, but there's just a massive number of Android and iOS devices. And F sharp developers, you know, do need to be able to go mobile. There are options for going mobile apart from Xamarin. The, the big one is using a system called Fable and targeting uh, React Native. And I, I don't know enough about Fable and React Native to be able to make a direct comparison between the two. It's, it's, it's a good option, uh, I'm sure, because people. Uh, uh, but um, Stefan Falkman, who I trust a lot, sort of says you know, it's got plenty of issues as well. I think all these tool chains have, have their issues sometimes. Um, but either way, F sharp developers need to go my, mobile, and the more we can bring to that space, the, the better. Uh, no, so Xamarin. So Xamarin is, uh, is a fantastic tool chain. It's got some amazingly solid components. When you look at Xamarin to going to Android, Xamarin.Android, Xamarin going to iOS, and you look at the compilation, Going, going through, I have not hit any problems in running F sharp code on either Android or iOS since the start of the entire six months that I've been uh, running, uh, doing work in this space. And when you think about the uh, the what needs to be done to get .NET code onto into iOS, uh, it doesn't. I don't actually know the full details. I know if you go by by uh, to Android, it does invoke the Java compiler at some point. It's you know uh, along the way. There's a, it's a sophisticated bit of uh, compilation technology, uh, but it really works well. Um, and uh, there are other, uh, it, it's modern, it's got .NET standard 2.0 components uh, that you can use with either Xamarin or use with uh, .NET Core or use with .NET Framework. And, and, and what I'm attracted to is it's, you sort of get the full .NET F -sharp semantics. Uh, what, what it means is when you, when you, when you target Fable and JavaScript with F-sharp, which is absolutely fantastic. But there are some differences. Some things, you know, type of might work differently in the, in the two settings, or uh, reflection may or may not be available or whatever. And, and uh, Xamarin uh, is, is, is really F-sharp as I've always intended it to be designed and used. Fable just makes a few, a few sensible design decisions when tar targeting JavaScript. Uh, Xamarin Forms is a fantastic cross-plat Mobile is actually more than mobile. You can run on Mac and, and, and Windows and so on. Uh, uh, 
And that's what we'll be using for the view side of things uh, in, in, in this setting. Okay, so my the question I really uh, you know, wanted to face, face up to, I uh, go to, to Xamarin, was can I make uh, F sharp, can I make Xamarin simple and compelling uh, for F sharp app, app development? Uh, I'm particularly focused on what, what's the point of view of a, someone who already does F sharp programming and needs to do a bit of mobile programming. Maybe they need to prototype, maybe they want to write a role, uh, 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 an app for them at, at home. Maybe they need to do app development for work. Uh, but I wasn't thinking about like teams of um, professional app development where you have split teams of, app, of designers and, and, um, and coders, at least not initially. I was totally fine for doing that kind of work. But I was very much about thinking, what's the F-sharp developer's perspective? How can I equip them to go mobile? Um, OK, so here's my rant to problem with XAML. Uh, so lots of rant, rant, rant here. Uh, um, okay, so when people do Xamarin today, uh, not everyone, Rob does things a bit differently to this, I think, a sharp Xamarin developer here, but the, the, out of the box, uh, it's a sort of a, there's, there's, historically there's been a lot of me too thinking in the F sharp world. Okay, so C sharp does MVVM, uh, we'll, we'll just do F sharp MVVM, uh, that, that's what the templates will be, we'll copy the C sharp templates, fix patch them up a bit, and that's, that, that, that's what our sharp Xamarin programming will be. And it's the same with WPF, uh, largely. Uh, okay, so everything's mutable in this world. You have a, you know, you have mutable model, and a mutable view model, and you have a mutable user interface widgets, and mutations come in, and if you're doing it really nicely, using a Halon or something, you kind of uh, get a mutation, and you use this reactive kind of system, and the mutations all pro pro propagate up. But everything is incredibly and incredibly mutable. And, and that's, it just, you know, I don't know. Uh, I just can't get too excited about this way of doing things, yeah? Uh, now, the, but the thing I really don't like is the fact you've got XAML on top of this whole system. And, and some people say, yeah, I hate putting my view, user interface in, in my code. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try and convince you that it's not that bad. And uh, it's actually great. And that, that actually, by taking your user interface, your, your view layer, and separating it into XAML, it's like kind of taking a, a layer off your skin, okay? A layer off your body. It's a bloody experience. There's left, lots of dangling, messy bits left in between. And um, it, it's really, these things belong together, okay? Uh, so it forces you to, the thing that you rip off kind of dies. It can't change as the thing goes underneath. Or if it does change, all the changes have to be kind of predicted in certain ways. So XAML ends up being very static, okay? And, uh, and then because it can't be static, it's got to be dynamic, because, you know, lists change in number of sizes and, and, and on, then it ends up having these extra computational things put into it, this sort of templating, uh, data templating things. And then layer, there's kind of <coughs> lots of weird layers of complexity to XAML. Yeah? And then it has these code-like constructs. I'll rant about one of these in a bit. Uh, behaviors and converters. And, 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 and then the whole aim was to separate off the UI so you could design the thing. But the designers need to understand all of this actual program-like stuff. And half the time that doesn't work, or other designers don't, don't understand some extra construct thing that's being used, like a resource binding or something. And, and then the whole thing kind of just what was the point? Why did we bother to do it? If it actually just makes everything more complex. So, so the idea of separating the UI is, fi UI is fine, but do we really have to have need a separate language to do it? Um, but for plenty of people do use XAML and MVVM. Uh, and with uh, Galahorn is a great is a great system. For example, uh, there's half Elmish systems uh, like Elmish WPF, uh, which are also pretty nice. So it's not totally like negative, but I just wanted to get the starting point that that's not the simplicity I'm after, okay? Right, so here's, a, here's, here's my example. Here's uh, George Cook, whoever that is. Hello, George, back in 2015, asking, how do I do not in, bi in a binding in XAML? I've got binding is logging in, and then the user interface, someone is enabled if they're not logging in, okay? Because that's when you can log in. And uh, he says, this is the bit I don't know how to do, not. Okay, uh, and uh, that's the answer. Yeah, 
What you need is a converter, a local negate Boolean converter. <laughs> X key inverter button clicked on login clicked, etc. Button is login static resource converter equals static resource in inverter. Okay, and you need some C sharp code in the right namespace, or you're toast with a silent error. And uh, public class, or probably hard crash error thing. Public crash, it's not. Uh, uh, the get converter, etc., etc., convert back and uh, back and forth. And finally, there are the two knots, which is the actual implementation of the thing. Yes, good answer, but someone who is not much familiar with XAML. They need to add the namespace in XAML file also to use that converter, just in case. Yeah. Okay, right, so that's not what I want. I, I want to get away from that world, right? Okay, so I took a long look around the F-sharp community, and I just thought, well, why is it so simple in Fable? What are they doing? You know, why does this web stuff look so much easier? You know, than all why are we making it so hard, okay? Uh, and uh, Fable, so Fable uses the Elm architecture, or the Fable Elmish does. Uh, and it's really nice, really simple. I'm very encouraged. If you're doing web front end, go and look at it. It's absolutely fantastic. Fable.io. Uh, and um, it's also very influenced by the end to end kind of piecing it together that's been done in SafeStack. If you haven't looked at SafeStack, I'll show you right now. Okay. Uh, and it is uh, end to end, Fable on the front. Uh, Cloud ready development, Azure generally on the back, and um, no, and great a great stack to use, and uh, really good guidance there. Hats off to everyone involved who's created safe stack. Um, so I, I was really just thinking, okay, safe is what we want for an end-to-end -end stack for F sharp. Then uh, you know, why can't mobile be a front end to this? Why can't Xamarin and mobile? Be. What would I need to make uh, a Xamarin app look like in order for the SafeStack guys to kind of not to, 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 to let me into their party? In a way, you know, I wanted to make something that they would appreciate as uh, the kind of simplicity that they would appreciate. So I'm very influenced by SafeStack, uh, and was also very influenced by Stefan Forkman sort of privately telling me on Twitter, I don't think you mind me saying that sort of non F sharp people, in fact, non coding business people, have actually found Fable. Uh, web, web development, incredibly simple and easy in, in business context. That's in the context of client cloud e-charging stations, um, sort of the front end to control e-charging stations. And, um, you know, if, if that's the kind of simplicity we want, when business people can be quite happy to contribute to app, app, app development. So, what's needed? The simplicity of Fable and Elmish, but for Xamarin. Okay? Uh, as I said, I don't have the exact comparison with React Native, but that's what I'm after. Okay, so here's an app. Okay, right. Okay, so we have up here the uh, it's very very simple architecture. Every component or the whole thing, as you stitch it all together, has these elements. You have a model, uh, has a button being pressed. You have messages that change the model that cause updates to the model. There's a message pressed. Um, you have an initial state, an initial model. The button hasn't been pressed, it's false. You have an update function, which processes the message, pressed, updates the model, and you're always using this functional update. And then you have the view down the bottom, which takes the model and tells you what to show. If the model has been pressed, if we're pressed, then we show a label. If it hasn't been pressed, the initial state, we show a button which says press me. Okay, so uh, it's model view update uh, model. It's um, uh, of, of, of development. And there's a little bit of code here to kind of stitch things together. You don't really have to worry about that. Every now and then you might uh, pass some fragments down through it. But really, this is the app as far as we are concerned. Okay, um, I'll do some, all the demo gods going well, I'll do some switch over now to try and do some live demo programming. I'm not going to instantiate the templates. Um, well, I'll instantiate one, but I'll actually use. One that I've already um, baked. So let's work this out here. Flash up. Oops. I'm going to need my glasses. Right. Um, okay. Where's our. There we are. I just want to copy out what I have here. This part here. Okay, that's how you get the templates. Uh, it's just a NuGet template pack. Uh, 
Okay, so you have to install Visual Studio or Visual Studio for Mac, and you have to enable both .NET Core and Xamarin. We're not really using the .NET Core side of things, uh, but um, we're using the .NET templating engine to instantiate the templates. Okay, so after you instantiate, uh, after you get the templates, you can create a new app like this, a new Elmish Forms app, and that's done. And then you have your file for chicken app, and you have it targeting in Android and iOS by default. Um, over time, we might add extra optional targets where you can add it automatically target Mac and, and, and WTF and so on. Um, right, okay, that's app creation. Uh, if you're using Android and you want to get going, there's a couple of extra steps you need to do. They're well explained on the Xamarin site. Uh, you have to enable developer mode on your device. And you have to install um, USB drivers if you're doing it for Windows, uh, some variation on, on Mac. And then you build and deploy using Visual Studio or Visual Studio for Mac. And you, okay. Um, okay. So over here, I've already done that. It's a slightly different app here. It's called Squeaky App. Doesn't uh, really mean anything, just a name. Uh, and I'll use a system called Visor here to show my uh, screen here. <coughs> and, okay, uh, things are working just fine. Okay, so when you do F5 build and deploy, the app runs and debugs, you can set breakpoints like normal. We do have an experimental live update system uh, for, uh, um, uh, which has got a couple of manual steps which I've already run. You run a daemon in the background in your project directory and it picks up changes in your project. It, it uses the F-sharp compiler service to compile them on the fly. Uh, the, the app is actually running a HTTP uh, a, a listener, yeah, a web server, and so we send the, a representation of the code down to the, the web server and it interprets the fresh code on the device. You only take, you effectively, you've got your app and you're just taking the top slice of your app. All the rest of the libraries stay the same is taking the top slice of your app and interpreting it. So what that means is that if you're using Live Update, and it is still experimental, the Live Update feature, uh, and it's really only a single file, the kind of last, the last file in your application. But what it means is if you make changes, for instance, we duplicate this button here, then when I press save, you get an update to your app, and you can actually use this sort of Live App development as a kind of way, just in the same way you do with Fable, you can use it as a way of, of prototyping the visuals of your app, uh, without needing sort of designer, designer tooling. It does work with iOS as well, uh, so just through the same, the same mechanism. There are limitations, however, but I'm using it for just now. Okay, so the app we've got here is a very simple one. Uh, so you, you can, it interprets the behavior of the app as well, not just the visuals. So that means uh, actually running interpreted code over on the right, and I can press the increment button. You'll notice that if I, as I save uh, a new, app, it actually reset the counter there, so we don't have a state migration uh, from instances yet. That could be added, and if you'd like to help with that, it's, a lot, it's an interesting bit of engineering work to take the values and migrate them across. Okay. Uh, it's definitely doable, but we're just not there yet. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of randomly do some uh, app, app development here. So what, what the first thing I'll do is, let's see, we'll add a decrement button. Okay, here we go, decrement. And instead of dispatching, the command that happens when the button gets pressed, instead of um, increment, it's going to be decrement. Okay, so we're changing the view function here. We'll go up and uh, better add a message here saying decrement. Okay, new message kind. We're getting a warning here saying we're not matching on a message here. We better go fill that one in. Decrement, and we'll do the minus one. Minus one. And we're going to save. I'm going to spell it correctly. The errors are gone, and we have a new button here. Super. Okay, well, let's uh, put in a reset button here. Uh, and it will dispatch a reset event. In all the pieces, reset here. And we'll just go back to the initial model, whatever it is. And we'll say that. Here. And reset. Yeah, let's make the first part of our uh, uh, dynamic UI. 
So we want to change the can execute on the reset button to be only when the, uh, the model.count is greater than zero because you don't want really, the reset button doesn't do anything at this point. Okay, so, okay, the update has been made and now we increment here and decrement, okay. Now, what's happening in this MVU model is this view is being repeatedly evaluated. It's a, it's a view evaluation model. Every time there's an update to the model, you reevaluate the view. And what that means is the programming can be very nice that the can execute is really just a Boolean conditional. That's kind of a reactive thing. You're reactive to changes in the model, but you just do it by reevaluating the view. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. Okay, uh, I will, um, let's see, what will I do next? Uh, I am going to add a timer event here. So let's just start by adding some messages with my cheat sheet. Uh, and we're going to have a, a timer command. I'll talk about commands in a moment. Model saying that the timer is on or not. And let's see, we're going to have to actually dispatch this event at some point. Uh, we're going to need this. Okay, so this gives us a we've added the, la the timer label. You can see we've got the switch at the bottom, and it's going to dispatch. Let's just run through this. It's going to dispatch the timer toggle event on or off. And when the timer toggled is turned on, then timer on will get that value. And now these update functions. When you get an update to the model, you can also dis dis generate what's called a command. And a command is simply something which will asynchronously generate more messages. All that it commands. Okay. So this timer command here is up here. It says that it's going to sleep 200 milliseconds and then generate a message. Okay? And it's an asynchronous message generation. One one thing. Then we get a tick of that event, and the model, uh, if the timer is on, then we increment the count and around we go. So that means we can increment here. We turn the timer on, increments go up, we can try to play a game to get it to go down, but it keeps incrementing, and then we reset, everything goes back. Because that initial model went back, the timer went off, everything stops. Okay. Okay. Okay, so then the in the I'm gonna to cut to a slightly larger sample now. Oh, really much larger. I did this in about half an hour or so. Uh, actually, this is correct here. And I'll just comment out a couple of bits of this. Don, do you want questions now or later? Uh, maybe after this demo. Sure. Yeah. Um, and okay. So what have I added here? It's actually starting with the same setup, a lot of bigger and smaller things. We're just in a counter for, this, for the size. Um, and uh, instead here, we have a, a grid at the bottom. And the grid contains images. And I've got eight images, actually, as part of the app. Uh, they are, where are the images? Here. Okay, they're called uh, SQ1 to SQ, 
SQ0 to SQ7. Actually, in the solution explorer here, you can see the, the or SQ1 to SQ8. Oh, that's one there. And there are resources in the app. And, there, and I've made myself a grid here. Actually, made a helper function to make the grid. There's make grid contains a view with the row definitions, the column definitions, and then the actual elements here. We have a, this is a general thing where it's a function where at a particular position it generates what's at that position of the grid. And then we make that grid, and at each position we place an image. And then we have the image. Okay, great. Uh, now, I've added a few things to the model, and I've set it up so the model is like a memory game, and the model contains, uh, where is it? The model contains the set of things we've revealed so far. We're going to flip all the images over to start with, and then we're going to click on them in the way of the children's game to reveal them. Uh, if you've and if you've made a choice, it remembers the first choice that you've made from a pair. And then it's got a solution. Although the images are flipped over, you know the, the app, of course, knows whether which images are which, and also remembers when you started the game. Now, the only we'll go through the code in a moment, but um, this is the code we want to add. That if, if an image has been revealed, then we show the image. Otherwise, we'll show a grayed out box view. Okay, so let's change that. Okay. Right, it's not any old box view though. I'll, I'll turn this back. It's a box view which is like a button. I just used the box because I wanted it to definitely look like a box. And any visual element in the Xamarin Forms model can have gesture recognizers. You can recognize touch, you can recognize pinch, you can recognize pan. You just add them in as gesture recognizers. So I want a tap gesture recognizer so that when I tap, it says, a dispatch batch is a message saying, reveal that image. So we have our reveal up here. And then it runs through the logic of the steps of the game. If you've made a first choice, then it does something. If you haven't made a first choice, it simply, in this line of code, then it reveals, it uh, adds to the revealed set and record, re records your first choice. So let's do that. Um, that code now. I'll just wait a few seconds because I'm using a version of the free version of Visor uh, to, to, to see my phone here, which shows these helpful lights every now and then. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll tap here on my phone, uh, tapped on the, the top left, and we went through this and then added it to the revealed set and recorded the first choice. Oh, that was my first choice. Now, when I'm going to tap a second time, it's going to come through two. Two possibilities, either I've got it right, they're both the organic uh, thing, uh, or, or I've got it wrong. Okay, now if I've got it right, uh, it checks for an end of game condition. This is the end of game, this checks whether everything has been revealed. That's this code here, is end of game, is end of game, this. Quality here. Save that and reset the game on the right. There it is. Tap the top left again. Uh, it won't be the end of the game, so we'll ignore that. It'll just record. Uh, if I've got it right, then it will reveal both of them. If I haven't got it right, then it uh, will reveal it, but then 200 milliseconds later, it will dispatch another message to hide it. Okay? So I tap. I got it right. Okay, so let's play a new game. Tap, click, and it's gone. Tap, and it's gone. Okay, uh, and that is the game. Now, <coughs> I think, okay, so let's play the game. Right, of course, and I won in massive 17 seconds. Very good. <laughs> Uh, we can uh, pop up yeah, the slides if you want to. Uh, uh, <laughs> I was hopeless at this game. Uh, but now you've practiced. Yeah. <laughs> I 
actually my best time. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so that that is just an example of how you can iterate on, on, on game development, uh, and it's uh, all ready to. It's all ready as an applicant. Um, it's all running interpreted at the moment, but you get uh, pretty you know, much better performance as well in terms of update and so on. Um, although what we've seen is totally fine for those purposes. Okay, um, so some detail, and then I'll hand over to Jim to talk about his, uh, his samples as well. Um, the view DSL, the view function here. Okay, so it's like XAML. The aim is it's kind of it looks like XAML, but it's all in F sharp code. Uh, it uses a lot of named and optional arguments, um, uh, which is a very important sort of tool for attribute heavy DSLs in F sharp. Um, so it looks like XAML. What do I mean by that? Here's a chunk of XAML, which you might, for instance, get from some app that you're copying as, as a basis or something. Uh, and you'll see content page, content page dot content, blah 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 blah, stack layouts, labels, buttons. If you look, uh, you also in XAML have to have a couple of other bits of stuff to the view model and so on. Um, but if you look at that XAML and compare it with the F sharp, uh, I've actually got one. There's a nested stack layout in the XAML for no particular reason, but. Um, that's not present in the F sharp, but otherwise you can see that everything is very similar. Some uppercase things have become lowercase, but all the other stuff is the same, all, uh, all in terms of names and things. So you, what it means is, you know, you can implement a paste XAML as view model pretty easily. It's pretty much a direct translation between the two. Uh, it's very much by design. Okay. The view function here, if you looked at its return type, it would be view element. Okay. So we don't give separate types to content page, stack layout, and everything. Everything is just a view element. Just like in Fable, one of the things that makes Fable simple is that everything in the view function is, or Fable element, everything in the view function is just a DOM element. Okay. It's just like, you know, you're just creating DOM elements all the time. It's like you're doing in JavaScript. And actually, you don't really need the strong typing. As long as you're checking, as long as the constructors are strongly checked, coming in, then actually it's pretty nice and simple. So um, everything is a view element. Uh, so you don't have data binding. All that data binding side of the XAML has disappeared. All these bits and pieces are gone. And you just have this view evaluation. You don't react to data changes. You just re-evaluate re the whole view. We'll talk about forms later. Uh, Multi-page apps still have a single view function. Okay, that just returns multiple pages. Uh, just looking at some of what the view DSL is like, uh, this is the various elements of uh, layout uh, for, for in the view DSL. Uh, and you just run through them. These are all documented. There are code snippet samples for all of them on the, um, on the documentation. Stack layout, absolute layout, relative layout, flex layout, and grid. And grid is what we were using for the game just then. Okay, so thinking about how you develop your app, uh, what is the model? To me, the way I, the, the litmus test is the model is what gets saved when an app sleeps and must be enough to resurrect the uh, essential state of the app. Uh, and so it has to be a, 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 a representation of the entire state space you can reach uh, from the start of your app through to the end. Uh, so that's my way of thinking about it. Uh, given a model, you have to be able to compute the view, and it's more or less pure functional code. Given a message, you've got to be able to compute the next model. Pure functional code. M messages are the only things that can cause updates to models. That's an important thing to remember. Okay. okay, you've seen some dynamic UI. Uh, to, as, as you um, change the size of your smaller, the size changes and so on. So one of the great things about Elmish is a lot of dynamic UI elements just kind of drop out in a very nice way. That can be whether your app mode changes, are you logged in, are you logged out, or your content changes, a few elements come and go, or sizes change and so on. Um, so you notice here, I just want to look at down the bottom right hand corner, the difference then if you need that not 
thing. Well, you just put in not. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty, it's just code and you can do computation. You've got all the richness of f -sharp computation to complete that view. And uh, you'll notice a lot of use of, of f -sharp list comprehensions, f -sharp list expressions, uh, as, um, as sort of a universal generator of elements in the, in the, in the view. Yeah, nice and easy. Okay, so Jim's going to take over now. Uh, we'll just we've got the top switch. Hello, you can hear me? No. Okay. No. <laughs> so, I'm Jim. I am a Xamarin Pokemon. I am a C Sharp developer. So, please don't stab me. I feel like I should be the most. So, my background is I'm a mobile developer. I love MVVM. I love UIs defined in things like storyboards, Android XML, and XAML. I like XAML. He's, he's going to stab me later. In fact, if you want a really good book on how to build Xamarin mobile apps with C Sharp and MVVM, I'm the guy who wrote that book. However, I do like a bit of F Sharp. I have dabbled a little bit in F Sharp, and I love the fact that I don't write that much code. Now, although I love MVVM, I love things like XAML, I really like just getting shit done. That's what I like doing. And I've played a lot with F Sharp, and I really like it because I can write a little bit of code and get a heck of a lot done with it. So I'm not an expert in F Sharp. I have never contributed to the Elmish Xamarin Forms framework because I'm not good enough at F Sharp. So I describe myself as an enthusiastic amateur. But I've been playing with it recently because I am an enthusiastic amateur. I am a Xamarin person. I've seen the work that one's done. And I really, really like it. So let's just start with a quick show of hands. Who's actually heard of Xamarin before today? Yay, plenty of people. So we all, we all understand how Xamarin works. Xamarin is very thin wrappers around the C Sharp, I'm oh, sorry, around the um, Objective C or Java SDKs that are provided by Apple and provided by Google. Xamarin allows you to get 100% native API access to everything you could possibly want to do from your .NET code. So it's been big on C Sharp from the start, but they've also brought some F Sharp in originally. And the way you build with F Sharp hasn't really been that great. It's been basically rewriting C Sharp code in F Sharp. Now, where I've been playing with this framework, and I've really kind of got into just how simple it is to kind of build something in a way that completely abstracts the concept of Xamarin away from me. So I don't just see this as a way to build a Xamarin app. I see this as a way to build a mobile app, and I abstract away from the whole Xamarin perspective. I have a nice Redux style, I guess, architecture that I can use to build my apps without even really thinking about what is the underlying infrastructure. <coughs> so we talk about this a lot as a Xamarin thing, but I don't like to think of this as a Xamarin thing. I like to think of this as a really nice mobile framework. And the Xamarin bit is the added bonus that means I get full 100% API access. So if you're thinking about building a mobile app with something like React Native, you get a similar experience with this, but with React Native, you want to hit the APIs kind of have an extra step in place, try to, an extra step to put those API calls in. Maybe you have to dip down to Objective-C, maybe you have to dip down to Java. With Xamarin, you don't have to do that. So I love it. And I, I keep saying that, I love how little code I have to write. So the very first thing I built was a tic-tac-toe app. It had knots and crosses. Now, I started off trying to work out how to build this in sort of classic C-sharp, MVVM, and Xamarin. Kind of way. And you have to write a lot of code. So who's done MVVM before? Okay, fair for you. I mean, it's, it's a good pattern. It works great for big enterprise apps built with WPF, you can take those skills, lift and shift to mobile. For some people, for some people, we obviously disagree. Um, but I think it's a good pattern for that. But it is very, very heavyweight. So if I wanted to build Norse and Crosses with MVVM, what would I have? Well, I would have a board as a view, and then I have a view model for that board. But 
But a Knowlton crosses board is really nine cells, isn't it? It's three by three grid, nine cells. So I would probably have another view model for each set. So I'd have a master view model containing nine sub-view models, one for each cell. And then behind those view models, I would want to have some kind of state of my app. I want to actually know whether a cell has got an empty cell, whether it's got a naught, whether it's got a cross in it. So I have a model behind my view models contained in my view model. I then want to build some things to tell me whether I've won the game or not. So I build a game service that's accessed by my view model that contains my view models that contain models. And as we're starting to get this really horrible mess of state to get a nice MVVM app. But if we use it, EXF, we really just don't have to worry about that. We can do the whole thing in tiny little code. So I've got an example here. I originally built this using what we called half Elmish, which was a bit of XAML, a bit of Elmish, and Don helped port this over to Elmish. But with this, you don't think about view models. You don't think about how do I architect this big complicated app. Instead, I just think about what does my app need to do? Well, first thing we have is a player. Am I a noughts or a cross? That is a player. I play noughts and cross. So we have a type of my player that's noughts and cross. Noughts and crosses, that's it. I then need a cell. <coughs> I have my, my board, my grid, and each cell is either empty, because I haven't played it yet, or it's a naught, or it's a cross. So I can model my cell. It's either empty or full of either noughts and crosses. So I've got this nice, this great union. I've got a really crisp. It's a tuple. Tuple, tuple. What do we prefer? Are we tuple people or tuple people? So we have the positions of tuple on the board. But we then have our messages because Elmish works by taking a message and pumping out through an update function, update the view. And what can you do in tic tac toe? Well, you can play or you can reset the board and start again. Or you can even change the size of the board if you wanted to. If you wanted to play maybe 4x4, 5x5. And then the board, we don't need to think about a 9x9 nine nine board. If I was modeling this with XAML and view models, I would define a 9x9 nine nine board because I define my XAML with 9x9, nine nine because to make a board that can change with different boards with different board sizes becomes hard, and I'm too lazy to do that. Here I can just say a board is just a map. Position to serve. And then I define my model with who's next, my board, what we have the state of play, and then I can do a board size to change that. All nice and easy. And then when I build my game, what do I need? Really? Well, I initialize my model. I've got a brand new model, brand new clean game. I can then put some code in to say, can I make any more moves? Little, I don't need to build myself a game service that evaluates whether the game has been won or not. I can do it in a function. And then I can just define my board lines, define whether we've got a winner. Obviously, we have to measure going across, going down, going diagonally, so we can work out whether we've got a winner in a particular line. And then I can just pump the whole thing through an update function. And that update function will then just check where are we, are we playing? If we are playing, we can check the result of that. Have we won, have we lost? If not, we just carry on and keep playing. And then I can just render that inside of you. And so I've got a grid here that contains a whole load of views here, and I can then make this custom if I want to to make it bigger or smaller. And that's kind of it. It's one file, it's 230 odd lines of code with quite a few comments in there. And actually, hopefully this will spin up fairly quickly. It was running fine earlier. Hopefully, you'll see this run, and we've got a nice little tic-tac-toe game without worrying about view models, with nested view models, with nested models and services, and all the nasty, horrible things you have to do if you're building a big, enterprise-grade tic-tac-toe app. Now, one thing I will point out is when you play a game of tic-tac-toe, if you win, and you're playing on the phone, you kind of want to notify the user that they've won. So if this spins up, I'll play a quick game for myself, see if I can beat myself. Okay, so I could say, like that, pops up to say we've won. And that is something that needs to be run from the application level. So I can actually start building some code that uses my app main page display and alert, pass that through to an update function, so that I've got access to all the different bits of my application. I've got this capability to build this lovely, clean set of unit testable code 
that I can write tests against, I can validate my code in code, and then I can pass in UI pieces to that if I wanted to. So this game over function uses the application's main page to display an alert on the screen. This is a UI thing. This is something I shouldn't be unit testing, but I can just pass this to an update function. And of course, I could then mock this out quite easily if I want to write a unit test for this code. So it's lovely, it's nice, it's clean. It's really, really easy. And for me, as an F-sharp amateur, coming to this for the first time, it was such an easy concept to understand. I didn't need to think about what is the right architecture. I didn't need to read a great big thick book or understand the best way to build this architecture. I could forget that. I could say, right, what do I actually want? Here's my data. Here's how my data changes. Here's how it's drawn on screen. So it's so simple. I keep saying simple. I just, but it is. It's simple. There's hardly any code. And I absolutely love it. Now, this is a very easy example. What about something a bit more? So with MVVM, a common pattern is a thing called dependency injection. Who's heard of dependency injection? Yeah, very heavyweight dependency injection, isn't it? You start defining interfaces, concrete implementations, then putting them into a container, and then resolving things from a container with constructor injection. And it's great, it's lovely, but it's very heavyweight. Now, I wanted to build an app to keep track of how much pocket money my daughter has. You know, she's five, she gets pocket money every, every week, and I can't be bothered to get cash out of a bank and give her cash. I just want to have an app that automatically tracks how much money I give her, and then I can say, right, she spent some money, I put it on my card, and I can reduce that balance. So I decided to build an app with an Azure backend, using the Azure Mobile Client to provide authentication. Now, the way the Azure Mobile Client works is it actually uses some platform-specific code to spin up a web view. So when you log in, you say, I want to log in with Facebook. We actually launch a web view. And in that web view, you log in with your Facebook credentials, so you're outside of the app, your, all your code is protected, you can use your password manager, you log in, and then it flips back the code. Now, that relies on having access to the underlying OS SDK. On iOS, we need to access the view controller, the topmost UI element that's rendered. On Android, you have to access the activity, the topmost UI element that's rendered. Now, to get hold of that, I need to write platforms with the code. And I can do that. I can go into my app delegate, for example, and this is an F-sharp wrapper around the UI, the UI app delegate code that is provided by the iOS SDK. This is a wrapper around it, derives from an application delegate that derives from the UI kit app delegate that comes from iOS, native API access here. And from here, I can write myself a function that can get the topmost view controller, and then I can pass that to the mobile client to log in. That then takes the top view controller, spins up a child view controller from that with a web view, allows me to log in. This is platform specific code. I can then do the same thing on Android, but on Android, the code is different. Instead, I need to pass in the activity, and the activity gets a web view spun up on top of it that I can then use to log in. Now, if I was building this in MVVM, I would write a login service. I would have an iLogin service interface with a login method on there, and I would write my Android login service, my iOS login service, with a whole lot more crap on there as well, and then spin up a DI container, and plug in lots of values with constructor injection, all the nasty bits and pieces. I don't need to do this. Instead, when I spin up my app, I can just pass in my function. I spin up my forms app and sign my platform switch the code, I pass in my function, and then, when I actually use this, this gets passed through to my Azure service here with an auth function. So I've got a bit of code in Azure service I use to actually talk to Azure. And then when the login message comes in, uh, I've lost my, my, where my code is, yeah. So I get my update. If the update is the, uh, yeah, sorry, get my init. It's my initial model. I then try and load the model. And then I can handle, if we're not logged in, we then launch the auth function. So I can take my function, I can just pass it straight through, and I can access all this platform specific code just by passing my function, rather than having to build up this great big horrible dependency injection tree using all these nasty bits and pieces to make it work. So it just makes my code so simple. I mean, 256 lines of code here, and I've got an app that spins up, 
um, I said, right, okay, let's get this one running. It's failing earlier because of uh, network connection. But it spins up, it pops up a login dialog, and then click on Facebook login, it launches a web page, I can log into Facebook, and then go back to my app. I can then increment and decrement how much money my daughter's got. All in 250 lines of code plus a couple lines of graph and stuff like that. And that's what's really powerful about this framework. Because it's powered by Xamarin, you get 100% native API access. Anything you can do on iOS, Android, you can do here. If you've got a Java SDK that runs on Android, you can take that Java SDK, you can drop it into a Xamarin binding library, you can bind it in .NET code, and then you can call it from inside an Elmish app. If you've got Objective-C CocoaPod, you can take that, you can bind it in a .NET wrapper, you can call it from inside an Elmish Xamarin app. So you get all the power of the native SDK, you get a lovely, MVU model for building your apps, but you get you get all that together in a way you just don't get with other cross-platform frameworks. Using things like Flutter, using things like React Native, you don't get that same deep level of API access out of the box with the framework. And I love it. That's my demo, short and sweet. Okay. I will hand you back. Thanks, Jim. mentioned this part. Uh, uh, this, yeah, unit testing. Uh, absolute majority of unit tests because you can mock. You can test your view, your up, your update, your init functions. Um, to test your update functions, you can you, you've just got functional data coming in, you, you, you pass out each different kind of message and you check the right uh, data is coming out. And to test your view function <coughs> You really can instantiate the view. You can search the view elements to check that certain text is appearing on the screen. You can, uh, and you can just mock the dispatch function to make sure that um, as you execute, as you, your tests sort of probe through the different logic of your, of your user, user interface, you can check that the right messages are getting dispatched in each of the cases. Right, let's talk about efficiency. Um, okay, so the idea of using view reevaluation just sounds off, right? So it sounds like it's going to be slow. Surprisingly, it's really it's certainly okay when updates are human speed, uh, and um, the crucial thing you need to know is that if you return equal view elements, that really means the same physical object, then you get zero update for that sub entire subtree. Okay, so if you um, if your view hasn't changed, you can nearly always any part of your view that hasn't changed, you can nearly always arrange it to return exactly the same object. It might require a bit of work on your performance side, but you, have, you don't get perform, full performance totally for free. You might have to do this depends on, you usually, usually do this using this depends on the trick. Okay, and I'll show you that in a moment. The next thing you need to know that after, that when you create a view description, uh, it is applied differentially with regard to the previous view description. You take the previous view element, take the new one, it, it runs over, the, the differential update mechanism runs over all the attributes and child objects and so on, uh, step by step to diff them across, just like in React. And uh, you, get, you don't get any updates if no base properties have changed. And if lists of things have changed, then it, it, it does it incrementally at the end of the list. And finally, you're in control, you can write custom differential update mechanisms for custom elements uh, and or for existing view re-wrappings of existing view elements. Um, <clears throat> okay, so those are the those are the core set of things. Um, to use depends on you if you say you had a slider view element and you you didn't want to keep recreating that view description. Even if you did recreate the view description, the actual visual element won't be replaced because nothing's changed in the differential update. But you may not. You want to, may actually want to skip the entire business of creating that view element at all, or a whole tree, subtree. The way that is, you have this depends on wrapper, and you basically list out the things that it depends on: model dot count and model dot step as a pair, and then you have a function which uh, inside you rebind model, so you can't use it anymore. It gives a different type to model, and you get the count and the step. 
and inside it gets used. And the basic thing is if these things haven't changed, then you'll use the same, exactly the same view on the description as last time. So just by some judicious placing of this depends on uh, construct, you can generally trim off all the re-evaluation re of view elements, and then your incremental update becomes in, in very, very fast. It skips that entire subtree unless something really has changed. Is, it, so, is there multiple variants of that? Because sometimes you might want a predicate to test. Uh, depends on it's very, a very simple thing, and you, there are certainly other ways you can stop uh, the recreation of view elements. Yes, there, there's only this one in the library, but it's a very simple piece of code. Any tricks you can play to basically return the same view elements as you returned last time uh, uh, will, will gain you more performance. Yeah. Um, so your aim is to change your view function to kind of be near constant time if nothing changes. Okay. There are other techniques you can use. You can use conditional width tables to associate. If you're a part of your model that hasn't changed, then you get a particular view element for free. Uh, you can keep version counters in the model. And there's a, a, there's large lists over about a thousand items uh, are a topic in the documentation. So please take a look at how those are dealt with. Um, and you can have infinite scrolling lists as well, where messages get sent as new as new sections are explored towards the end of the list. Okay, uh, I'm not going to run. I will. Sorry, I will run the last one, but I won't launch it. Uh, right. uh, okay, Elmish Contacts. This is a fabulous, fabulous sample. Um, I'll show you the code here. Just type in Elmish Contacts. It's done by uh, Timothy. Um, Tim, yeah, uh, that's and how much contacts here. Okay. okay, so let's take a look at the app. Uh, we have uh, some contacts. It doesn't automatically integrate with your phone. Yeah, that's not part of the app. <laughs> uh, we've got Thomas here, t t t thomas at gdpr.net, uh, address 10 Downing Street there. Uh, and we can add something uh, else here. Microsoft Research uh, listed on the map. Okay, so you can see the elements of the app there, and it's a fantastic example. I've already seen uh, somebody take this and build another app. Uh, uh, just a map for editing and searching, lists of things with an on phone database. So it uses an on device SQL Lite uh, integration, uh, has maps, it has asynchronous data loading onto the map. So the map is displayed initially, I think, with Paris at the center, but then it finds your location asynchronously. And then that will come up, and then it'll, the, the, the pins get loaded asynchronously, and then they'll come up. Uh, there's um, SMS, phone calls, email, it's multi page editing, and lists of things, taking photos, a splash screen at the start. And it's, it's pretty decent design in, in the app. Uh, so, great end to end sample. We'll just take a dive into a couple uh, of examples of the code. Um, so we'll come to Elmish Contacts, and we can more or less choose any of these. First, the repository. This is the SQL Lite uh, in integration here. Uh, and I'll, then we'll look at, say, the map. So 
I mentioned the other one. Uh, looked at it, so the map, okay, so you, you develop each page separately, and each page has its own messages, each page has its own model, and then we're going to compose those uh, at, in, in the overall app. Uh, we, um, as I, I explained, the asynchronous loading onto the map, so we start by showing the map, and then we ask to retrieve the user position here, uh, and then when the user position is retrieved, we're going to do something. And then we ask to load the pins for some contacts, and once those addresses are turned into locations, we've, we've loaded the pins. And that, that basically explains the evolution of the, of the page. Uh, and you can look through the code later, but we'll just take a look at the, um, the view. So it uses depends on, it depends on the user position, and uh, the, whether the pins are loaded. Or not, or, uh, and which pins are loaded. Uh, and you can see that when we're retrieving the user position, the model stays the same, but it fires off an asynchronous process to eventually report the user position. That will come back, user position retrieved. You, get the, you record the user position, and then the view will be updated based on the change in the user position. The actual page, the, the, the look, of the map here um, is uh, you can see the design of the page there and it's a content page it's a title icon when the page is appearing it starts off this process to retrieve the user position when we get the pin if we have some pins then we show the map if we don't have any pins yet then we just show the label it's a dynamic thing nice and simple and dynamic loading the map uh, we, we request a particular region at a particular center. The center here is Paris, if we don't know where the person is. <coughs> Otherwise, it's well wherever the person is. Okay, so that's the map. Um, the other part I'll look at is, I think, in app here, which is where the whole app is composed. So through the front page of the app here. So uh, this puts together all the pieces, uh, and the map has a model, uh, the, the favorites page has a model, uh, and, and so we have our different messages for the main page, the detail page, for the editing page, and we compose all the different kinds of messages together, plus with some additional kind of messages about navigation and the like. And then we compose the model together, Main page detail added about, plus some. Uh, there's actually a, a workaround here you can read up on that. Um, that's, yeah, you can, you can look at that related issue on the Elmish side. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, the multi page app still has a single view function, which will be down the bottom here. Uh, and there's and, it, and it, it runs through and creates the overall navigation page, which lets you navigate through the different structure of the app. So a multi-page app still has a single view function, and the navigation page has a stack of sub-pages. Um, multi-page app has a single model, single message type, single update function. You develop the pages sort of independently, and then you compose them together. Now, one thing about composition, and this is for OO developers, is a bit odd, I think, because it requires a bit of rethinking. If the pieces compose separately, the models compose separately, the messages compose separately, uh, so you have an overall union type which contains all the different possible sub messages, then the update functions compose and the view functions compose. Um, so. so, encapsulating thing is not really the emphasis. Okay, you don't hide this bits and pieces in objects or anything. Everything's kind of revealed. Uh, it's kind of got to be that way because when you save out the stage, you've got to save everything. Uh, so encapsulation is kind of de-emphasized. And you should kind of just turn, a, turn that off that part of your brain that wants to encapsulate model, model uh, state. I mean, it's still separated, but not fully encapsulated. Uh, okay, and the other thing that Elmish Contacts has is some extensions, and I want to talk about this. And this is only really applicable if you're extending things on the view side of things. 
But for instance, you might need an extension for maps, or for Skia Sharp, or for charting. But Skia Sharp is for 2D graphics. Urhu is for 3D graphics. Uh, each extension is a little DLL. Uh, so four, three of these extensions come with the framework, and uh, we're probably going to be adding a lot more over time. Um, so to show the Urhu Sharp in action, this, this app, uh, also by Timothy, called Elmish Planets, uh, and it's just um, loading up this 3D scene based on the user selection, uh, setting in process the Urhu uh, rotation uh, of the, view, of the view, viewport. Um, and you can take a look at the code for that in um, Elmish, Elmish Planets. Yeah. That's this code. It's <coughs> this code here. Yeah. Uh, um, go through and look at that. Implementation. Um, okay, so to talk about extensibility, I mean, one way to extend view elements is just to take existing view elements and make functions that generate them. So make scrolling content page. So you just use functional abstraction to kind of abstract the right functions to generate bits and pieces of your view. And that's nice and simple. You just kind of call this as many times as you like, make scrolling content page. Uh, you can use um, the, the API mechanism here. This is to make it look more like a, a part of the API. View with scrolling content pages, this and the non scrolling content page, and so on, and call it down below. Uh, but sometimes you need an entirely new kind of view element, like when you're making a map, uh, an extension for maps. And then there's an extension mechanism you can do to create those view elements and tell, and tell the framework what the differential update mechanism is for those items. That's, um, that's what this update thing is down below. That's all documented and people have been able to do it. And it's, if you need to wrap new kinds of view elements like the ones I mentioned, charting and the like, um, then you can do that. Okay. okay, the live update mechanism I used at the start it is experimental. Um, uh, I've explained how it works. It interprets on device, uh, communicates via HTTP, works on iOS or Android, two second update time. It's only one file at the moment, but please dive in and help with the, uh, the engineering on the framework to make that um, allow for any file in the app to be changed. Uh, you can do state, you can't do state migration, but you could add that. Uh, and there's some manual startup steps you need to run. They're all documented on the site. It's only in debug mode at the moment. Uh, and there are some limitations for interpreting on the device, but we can gradually get rid of nearly all of those uh, over time. Okay. Uh, you can cheat, like in F sharp, you can cheat. F sharp functional programming, you go from cheat by using mutable state here and there. You can cheat in this as well. There's three cheats, uh, which no one's really used much yet, but uh, might be of interest to people who like cheating. Uh, one is to allow some local mutable state completely unrelated to the model. Kind of breaks a functional approach, but might be good for animations and ephemeral and rapid mutation kind of code. Uh, you can also do the same with immutable state, and you can also wrap arbitrary other Xamarin forms objects uh, that you might have pages or views or whatever you've got around with view.extern. Uh, it might be good if you integrate it in a larger app or have some sample code for integrating in. Some final set of uh, pra pragmatic state persistence is uh, it's really, really easy. You just write it out with the JSON serializer to serialize your model and you've got your state saved. Uh, when the app resurrects, you can just resurrect it back and generate a model and you're off. We don't include any time travel debugging in, by default, uh, but you can actually add it in as a kind of in-app feature. You kind of save your models as you go along in just a list, and there's an app.setModel where you can kind of just change the model behind your app and you can level call the view function and your view will change and everything will go back to whatever past history there was. So if you want to put that into your app, you can in a debug mode or something, you can do that. If you're worried about app size, there are notes in the documentation. You can just use the standard Xamarin linking and reduction steps uh, on device. Um, you do platform specific, Jim's covered those. The core app is .NET Standard 2.0, but uh, you can do Droid and iOS and do the kind of things that Jim will show, the passing platform helpers. 
And finally, uh, uh, about deploying, you've seen that the Elmish Contacts app is up there on the app stores. So just follow totally standard deployment and signing, and that's, that, it's fiddly. There are dialogues and project file entries and things. You just follow what's mentioned in the, in the docs, and it's well described in, in the docs. Uh, okay, right, so that's it, and I know the pizza's getting cold, so we better uh, uh, finish up. Um, EXF is simple, F sharp friendly, functional mobile app programming. And please get involved. And uh, here are lots of resources on the site. There's an all controls sample, which goes through every single control in the core Xamarin uh, forms uh, controls. Uh, uh, and so you can see code snippets in that. There's the awesome uh, Elementary Xamarin forms by Jim. Xamarin Essentials has lots of stuff you also need to know. And there's Amaran Docs as well. And thanks very much. If you want to go get pizza, we'll just go get we'll ask, do some questions. Yeah. So a quick question, Mark, about the extensibility. Yeah. Uh, how easy is it to uh, link your custom controls into, say, custom renderers? Yes, custom renderers are possible, and in fact, the um, Elmish Contacts app has some custom renderers. Excellent. So, you know, the was <coughs> yeah. going to try. I've never done it, so I rely on Timothy's way of doing it. Yep. Uh, the demo gods have been very good for you today. So, yes. do you offer them <laughs> thanks and praise? Yeah. <laughs> What's the appropriate thing to do? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know, you seem to be the expert. <laughs> <laughs> you always want to for me, I'm hoping to get some tips. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Demo. Uh, yeah, God, is that better? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm trying that one next. Okay. Uh, anyone else had a question? Yes. Um, where are you on um, where brackets should be? Oh, we're pra actually, that is the hardest thing about Elmish Server Forms program. Uh, now, this is, is actually indentation and brackets. Uh, because you probably notice I use a whole bunch of different styles in the, in the talk. And uh, I, uh, uh, we even made a change in F sharp 4.5 based on this to allow a more flexible indentation uh, uh, for some constructs uh, because it was just complaining too often for my life. So I don't have any fixed view on totally fixed view on this. I noticed that the style I, I, I used to use for a sharp code, well, when you're writing the view descriptions, you just tend to place the brackets in slightly different positions and use slightly different indentation. I'm not, I'm not gonna, I, I, as long as you vaguely indent your code, your view descriptions will be totally fine. Yeah. Are you in favor of Elvis? So yes, I actually. The update uh, function. Yeah, I, sh I, I should have. Um, I should have talked about that. Uh, thanks for asking. Um, so if you take uh, so some random so code here, uh, I mean everything. This could be exactly in favor of Elvis, except for uh, the view DSL is different. So the view dot label would be you know little lowercase label HTML element or something. Uh, but really very, very similar. Uh, you, in, in small cases, you could probably reuse the same model and just reuse everything the same and just have a different view function. Sometimes, sometimes in more complicated controls, some elements from the, you know, the way that validation gets done or when you need to validate or something might. I, I should have mentioned validation. Validation generally gets done in the update function. Uh, so that as text get in, gets entered, messages get sent, and then validation gets done, and errors get displayed in the view function based on, on, on results. Um, and the model might record whether uh, there are errors to display or not for a particular <coughs> entry. Um, so I, I, in general, I th certainly all your validation logic tends to get shared if you're going to really try and do a web app and a mobile app. Uh, often that gets shared because it's also shared by the service, the, the, the cloud service you've got behind everything. Um, I, I, I expect 
quite a lot of other things will drop out to be shareable between a web and mobile, but not everything. It shouldn't be too religious about it. Um, yeah. But the, the approach is extremely similar. There are differences in detail. There's some things I'm not totally happy about in the Elmish model. One is, for instance, this. I mentioned this thing called command, and I quickly explained it as a command is just something which asynchronously generates messages. And for me, that's a really simple concept, right? It, and it doesn't need a new name. It's just something. The, the fewer names, the better. You can say it's some. We have something that asynchronously generates messages. It's probably an async message. Close, close to that. So um, there are some differences in the, the, the Fable Elmish includes a bunch of helpers which kind of bake in a, a bunch of concepts and names which really aren't that central to the, to the way things work. So I haven't really highlighted them yet in the, in the samples. The command probably comes from like WPF though. Well, that's right. That's one of the problems. The is there's two, no, there's two notions of command. One is the one used in Xamarin and one is the one used in Elmish. And, why I de-emphasize it, because you, you don't really need either of them. Uh, yeah. Sorry, but fewer names the better. Yeah. So I can see command getting confusing though, if you come from the NVVM background, you know what a command is, you think it's the I command interface, I've got my can execute, my execute, you then come to this, the command is not an I command, it doesn't work the same way. Yeah, so you just avoid, you want to avoid that conflict. But you've still got your can execute, which, which is effectively in this world, um, it's still reactive. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, but it's yeah, so, so, so underneath, yeah. there's some exam reforms, obviously, it's in commands and things, but, mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah, you don't want the conflict in terminology. Yeah. With Elmish, so. I mean, you can even see the word command down, down the bottom there, the command that gets run. Um, but that's kind but of it's a But it's only a function in this thing. There's no I command interface. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? We can, yeah. You all want to keep your update functions pure, or do you have things that reach out to databases? Uh, so you certainly have handles to databases in your model, and that, uh, that would be a case where you can't just naively serialize the model uh, as, as, as JSON. So yes, uh, Jim's logon service uh, example, I think, has a handle to the add to an Azure mobile services or something in the model. So um, the update functions are purely functional in, in, that, in that, like, no handles. So would you rather um, spawn a command than do something in the um, command? Uh, yes, I believe that's normally the pattern, is that um, just nearly everything you spawn will eventually generate a message. That's the right thing to do is to, to start off something which will eventually. I mean, we saw that in some of the samples already. Um, you spawn off something which eventually, um, yeah. So it's, it, you certainly have database connection handled in your model, um, uh, and yes, you'll normally ex use those handles in when you spawn off or when you call and connect. Uh, the, one, one of the things I like about the model is a lot of experience with implementing this, these kind of apps. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of experience in the Elmish world of Fable, and you can actually just ask those guys and talk about, hey, look, you know, this architecture thing, I'm not quite sure how, how it goes. And even though they're doing web dev, all the same lessons in, in, in coding practices and design patterns actually apply pretty well. Um, so, for instance, one, one common example is you have multiple pages and they, have they kind of cause navigation events and, and you consider those to be external messages. So the page has internal messages and external messages. And as you compose them, you resolve those external messages by you say, well, if you press save here, we end up back here. And um, that's exactly the same pattern as in Elmish web. And I was able to just reuse that. And Timothy uses that as well. So it's really good at sort of design pattern reuse. Yeah. Cool. Uh, next question. You're going to write a type provider for it? <laughs> Do you want me to write a type? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd love to.
Okay, let's break the topic. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, I've just got two things for those pieces, so keep it very quick. Uh, we've got one copy of Jim's book, which I'm sure is excellent. Which is lucky. everything Don has just described he hates. <laughs> <laughs> if you're lucky, he might even sign it for you. Uh, so we were going to give this to the best uh, uh, question, uh, and there are a few good ones, but uh, did you have a preference? I think the Starbase was good. There's one good one over here, which uh, I didn't know, unfortunately, I can see exactly who asked it. Maybe Jim's interest. Oh, no, 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 I'm not cheating. Let, let Don do. Uh, I think I've got this, this question here on, you know. Okay, congratulations. And finally, Andrew is going to uh, announce an upcoming event. Here you go. Um, hello, so um, Don was talking about contributing to open source, and then Jim said, Oh, I'm not good enough, but my imposter syndrome attacked me with a bat or something. And I thought about something we do in a thing called Syntactic Sugar London. Uh, so we meet every now and then to contribute to open source. Uh, well, every once a month. And the next one is in Depop in Shoreditch. So the past two events we did uh, mock programming on PureScript. Uh, because that's what we felt like. And the one upcoming, uh, we're working on HTTP, HTTP4S, which is a web framework for Scala. But the idea of the meetup is you, you plan what you want to contribute on, like something that you're actually interested in. And then you say it, you say it to us by GitHub pull, re pull request. And you can just work on that. Or if you want, you come to whatever it is that the most of the group is doing. That way you get an introduction to open source that is slightly less uh, intimidating or you know, uh, whatever. It's um, generally not very, very popular. So um, we're at like 10, 15 people. And I thought maybe some of you might be interested. Um, so just look for it. It's on Twitter, the, the registration stuff. Or if you have any questions, let me know. I'll mention a couple of things. Now that summer's over, it's a great time to start thinking about what talks you'll give at F Sharp Exchange next year. That's be, I don't know the exact dates, April, it's on the School of Mad site. And uh, sooner or later, I'll ask for proposals for F Sharp talks. See if you can rival Jamie's talk on NASCAR racing uh, from last year, which was a fantastic, fantastic talk. And there are lots of great ones, but I um, know it's very memorable. Uh, and so, yeah, start to think what you're, what you're going to propose. You know? We've got a really great local group of talks, so we um, work to rival all the international people we get coming in. Uh, okay, uh, anybody hiring? New York. Okay, Wendlers here, so Wendlers who are a host tonight, are, are, are hiring. Um, okay, full stack F sharp, uh, positions, and um, so front end, uh, app developers, and back end. Front end app developers, F sharp. Front-end front and F-sharp back-end. No, front end. Front -end. Well, well, the front-end developer's kind of choice is, is that what he or she will, will be using. You so that doesn't matter. I, we have F-sharp back-end, so of course right. we would be happy with, with Xamarin or, or Fable so or whatever. Awesome. So front-end developer, whatever technology yeah. you want to bring, whether it's F-sharp or not, and back-end uh, F-sharp positions. Okay, uh, great. That's that pizza. Thank you.